Come in. Who is it? No! Ah! <laughs> Welcome once again to the Club of Heroes. I am your host, Chris Bearden. I've got two fine gentlemen in the room with me. Evan Arnold. Mm, Mr. Fine Cortinas. Mr. Fine Cortinas. Whoa, is that your wrestler name? Yeah. Yes. That's my wrestler name. You should see my costume. <laughs> is it like all Lex Luger? Do you just have like a feather like, boa? <laughs> oh, you'll proceed with the program. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right, away from question. that uh, <laughs> virgin wrestling career. <laughs> Tonight's topic is horror comics. My ah! Oh, the so horror. But, uh, I'm scared so already. Horror comics are no laughing matter, gentlemen. They were almost the bane, almost the end of the comic book industry in the circa the 50s. Yeah. Want to be right? Actually, I find it ironic that the things I love most almost cause the things you love most to stop existing. No! <laughs> <laughs> Why do you do that? Change your interest. <laughs> uh, Evan, Mr. Evan Arnold here is our resident horror comics expert and uh, very scholarly ways can contribute some notes here. Yeah, actually, yeah. I've got some notes here. Um, before I dove right into it, though, I, I kind of wanted to um, ask everybody and with us right now, being you two guys, right. Mr. Fine Cortinas and Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I want to address you by your full name. <laughs> like, a, it's like a title. you got to say the whole thing. I do. And I, I'll try to throughout this, this program. Um, what, what, what do you think... What do you guys think makes something a horror comic, like, other than, like, a crime comic, or even a suspense comic or thriller? Um, like, what is the difference? Do you want to go first? Well, I, I perceive... Yes, I will go first. <laughs> <What I perceive. laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I watch a horror movie, and, yeah. you know, I'm just sitting there watching it. I know something scary is going to happen until... Yeah. I just don't know when. So, I, I guess... That's the suspenseful part of it, but when I'm reading a horror comic, um, I just don't feel the same. It's like, oh, okay, I turn the page, oh, this monster jumps out of a door. <laughs> yeah, I'm not scared of that. And in a, in a sense, it's the same suspense that you're waiting for. Like, Isn't Walking Dead considered a horror comic? Definitely. It is. Mm -hmm. The only thing that got me in that was... I know, like, the people turning on each other is supposed to be, like, this suspenseful part. But is when, spoilers, cover your ears, earmuffs, is when Lori dies. Oh, that yeah. was, like, the big turner for me. That is very graphic. That yeah. was the only That's a two-page spread. It's yeah, like, yeah. not just a, an aside, oh, she's dead. No, you get to see what happens. And yeah. it's pretty fucking terrible. And, you know, that's the only thing that really shocked me in that. Oh, that was the only one? Oh, I knew every, all this other stuff was going to happen. You know, I didn't know exactly... Oh, like, what uh, happen, so, like, you weren't, you weren't shocked when, like, the twins got their heads cut off and they were zombies in the prison? Like, not really, no. Really? No. I, that, that got me. I was like, whoa, that just really, they just killed kids in a comic book. Like, that's, uh, that's like so horrible cool. about that. Well, really? <laughs> Avengers <laughs> Arena? <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I don't know, I, I don't mean to, like, hurt you, I just don't feel for your horror comics. Like. I understand that. I mean, what, what do you think, Chris? Like, what, what um, would be the difference? I don't think horror comics, comics. <laughs> necessarily have to involve <laughs> zombies or vampires or monsters of any kind. I think the definition of a horror comic is that it lacks the redeeming moral qualities of, say, a superhero serial or even something like Conan. In a horror comic, the bad guy wins or the good guy loses. You know, and it's not... Uh, you don't stand up and clap at the end. There's, there's no clear moral ending. It's kind of ambiguous. Yeah. Kind of yeah. a thing. Okay. I okay. like that. I feel like kind of an asshole for like, <laughs> you like bad guys to win, Evan. No, no, I'm just fucking with you. Um, I'd agree with both of those. I think that, I think the reason why horror in general is still so popular, uh, and it has been for, you know, a long time, it's not like a genre that died and came back, like a Western or whatever. Um, well, it's probably in the jo broader category than a Western, really. Mm -hmm. That That's the side. Um, I think that, you know, terror, anxiety, all those emotions are probably some of the oldest emotions you can feel, like, ever. Like, that's your lizard brain talking to you. Yeah. That's the part of you that's, like... Easy there, David Icke. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't no lizard man. Lizard man. <laughs> Go on. But, uh, you know, that, that's, like, the part of you in your ancient ancestors that said, hey, don't fuck with that snake, something bad will happen to you, or don't climb that tree. You know, you'll fall out of it and, you know, break your femur and you won't be able to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, I think that kind of primal, uh, 
emotion is less refined and more uh, primitive than, like, you know, uh, anger or any of those kind of feelings or happiness, you know? I think that's why they've retained their popularity, because of that that primal link to... Yeah, and the fact that you kind of excite yourself by looking at something terrible. You watch a... (laughs) (laughs) Not you, but anybody. (laughs) And if you at home listening, I'm not accusing you either, but, <laughs> but everybody watches something, you know, like they say, a car wreck, you can't look away from it. When you watch yeah. a horror movie, there's a, a base part of you that's just like, oh, I want to see what happens to this chick in this horror movie. Exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have felt that too, actually. You have a bad day. There's an allure. Like in um, Centipede. Man. The, human, oh, the Human Centipede? Oh, I haven't seen that, actually. Neither have I, and I don't plan to. Yeah, I've seen it once. I think it's a great movie. But I have no desire to ever see it. <laughs> With stomach churning, like oh yeah, like, it bothered me really bad. And you don't really even see that much when you think about it. You don't uh, see a lot of explicit gore. Oh. They, it's the way they just imply things. It's, yeah. Yeah. That's probably the best way to do it is to imply something. Like there you go, you exactly. Know. Like as I've heard you say before, imagination is. Something. The most powerful aphrodisiac. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> um, imagination is like, just um, stronger than truth. I don't know. Well, it's what you don't see is what... Yeah. Yes, the implications. The yeah. You know, uh, like in the first Halloween movie, you really never, you never see Michael Myers ever, except when he's... He's never there. He's always in the backdrop... Or he's just there for a split second, and you think you see him, and you look back, and he's not there. Like, you can watch the film through the eyes of the characters that he's hunting down and killing, and that, I think, makes it a much more effective tool than, you know, a film where he's there all the time, because you never know if he's going to be behind that corner or not, kind Uh of thing. You know, it's the unreveal that's better than the reveal. But, uh, yeah, and that's really why I like horror comics. I like that, that adrenaline, kind of, you know, um... And I know it's not, you don't get quite the same anticipation watching the film as you're reading a comic book, but I still kind of pick up on it. And the reason I like EC in general, the older EC stuff, is because it's kind of poetically, uh, there's a lot of po- poetic justice in it. It's really, uh, has, has a lot of ironic justice. Uh, I, I remember there's one story in particular, I forget which issue it was, but like there was a, um, it was like a Jack Spat and his wife kind of story. Yeah. Where like, uh, I think that the wife was scheming to uh, inflate the husband, make him fatter, and explode. And the husband was trying to kill his wife by dropping a safe on her to make her thinner. <laughs> Just something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and this was warping children's minds. Like, they were worried about this back in the day. I can't, I can't imagine. Um, but, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess ever since the... Uh, that's why I like horror comics. I, I like that. That edge, uh, and I guess I, I mean, I've always kind of stuck reading them. I've read Poe when I was a young kid. And that's kind of uh, gone over to other things. EC in general, I think it's pretty cool. I, I like I like that they pushed the limits that were set then. Uh, so EC, how does that come about? Do you know anything about the origins of EC comics, or at least their horror line? Definitely. Um, I guess we could talk a little bit about how horror comics in general arrived, because EC wasn't the first one on the scene. Okay, enlighten me. Well, one of the biggest. Um, who was around before EC? Sure. Uh, for starters, the idea of horror comics in general, they really came from pulps. I like the, uh, the grittier pulps, um, where there's, a, there's like a sub-variety of, uh, a pulp where it's like a, wom- it's like a woman in peril story, or like a <laughs> sadistic torture story. And you see it sometimes in films or whatever with like, oh, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more graphic than it was then, but like in a film like Saw or something like that. Right. Uh, where they just call it gore porn. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lost its, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> it's lost its pan ass, Mr. Chris. Pan ass. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it was really, they really, they really came from this weird menace kind of story. Were like, uh, you know, it featured, for the time, really graphic scenes of torture and brutality. And there's like this mad doctor kind of guy. We're going back to the mad doctor kind of trope. It's like a subtrope of that, which, you know, came out about in Superman. Preying on everyone's right. fears of going to the doctor or dentist. Yeah, <laughs> dentist, dentist in particular. <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, and that first came about from a publication called uh, 
popular publications underneath their uh, series Dime and Mystery, which is a straight crime fiction magazine, but by uh, 1933 turned itself into kind of a horror imprint. I guess the horror stuff was catching on, and it swallowed the rest of the, yeah, the actually, magazine. Um, kind of. Dime Mystery, it's a funny story. It was actually uh, heavily influenced by uh, the Dada art movement in France, in pre-war France at the time, oh. through this thing called the, the Grand Guignol Theater, which was this live-action theater, and it was really... I think it's Guignol. Guignol, you know, yeah. yeah. So, it's a weird I see, word. I, I see the I letters, word I can't fucking about. say yeah. it. Chevrolet, Chevrolet. Yeah. <laughs> Les Miserables. <laughs> Les Miserables. <laughs> right, I'm sorry. But that. you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. so you, so you've heard of it before, then, Chris? No, I've heard that word. Okay, before. you've heard the word. Guignol. 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 Sorry for our French listeners out there. Anyway, um, they specialize in a really sur- surrealistic, uh, disturbing imagery kind of stage play that invited audience participation as well. Like, they do things like they have a mock execution or things like that. They're just really kind of shock pieces meant to arouse an emotion in the audience. And I think, um, from what I was reading, that's where Dime Publications, or Dime Mystery, or or popular publications took their ideas from, kind of, it was that kind of shock theater that was very popular then. They wanted to, you know, sell more books, and what sells better than, you know, uh, controversy, so stuff it full of that. Um, and that's really where horror comics come from. Um, you know, and you, once, once, uh, popular had Dime Mystery, Horror Stories, and Terror Tales. Ooh, spooky <laughs> battles. In case you were wondering what was in that comic. Okay. <laughs> but at the time, these weren't straight, uh, horror stories. These, uh, you know, it wasn't like the wolf man was biting somebody or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like a Dracula thing. Like, uh, they, they involved, uh, cases which may involve the paranormal, but most of them at the end had a rational explanation. Um, so, but some did involve the supernatural, like, as a straight thing. What about, like, uh, domestic horror? Like, when you think about the, the Troubles horror comics would face later on, there's that cover of the man holding a woman's severed head, and there's these kind of, like, marital disputes gone wrong, and relationships that turn to murder. Was that, uh, catching on as early as then, or was... Uh, that's, uh... Was the gothic influence still... It's a mishmash, really. Um, I'd say that the the kind of more domesticated horror kind of stuff, that comes about uh, as a, a weird menace kind of crime story, as they got more explicit and violent. And, um, you know, uh, horror fiction elements that start popping up in superhero stories, the vampires, uh, you know, uh, monster guys, mad scientists, and stuff like that, that really came from universal monsters. And uh, their, uh, you know, the Universal films of yeah. Dracula, Frankenstein, etc. Uh, film adaptions of, you know, works of literary repute. Not exactly, not yeah, exactly. Loose adaptations. Yeah, loose adaptations. It's, you're not exactly <clears throat> fucking cutting off Mary Sue's head and throwing it in the sewer, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's something that people actually read. And it, was, it was beyond the rebuke of horror comics. You know, they put that in the shelf. Um... By the, by, by the mid '40s, some detective and crime comics uh, had horror motifs like spider webs and eyeballs and stuff in the cover. And um, uh, really, what took it what took it off though, like in the mainstream, was they started doing um, uh, tales again, like Edgar Allan Poe stories or stuff like that. Like if you look at my long box in my uh, Tales from the Crypt stuff, I've got Ray Bradbury stories in there. That they paid Ray Bradbury for that they did oh, in their nice. tales in print. So it was kind of a popular thing. And is that, is that like little prose sections, or did they actually... Oh, no, it's actually full panel. It's a comic book? It oh, is a comic. Holy shit. I, yeah. I gotta look at those. Like, yeah, they're, they're pretty cool, honestly. If you read nothing else, you should probably read those. It's good. They're good adaptations. They got their money's worth out of Bradbury. Um, let's see, I think it's... Uh, you know, and they're really based off of that and, uh, you know, radio host kind of stuff with, like, the Whistler, mm-hmm. Inner Sanctum, Suspense, Quiet, Please, that kind of stuff. Those were all very ra- uh, popular radio programs at the time that featured a omniscient observer host, kind of like you'd see later with the Crypt Keeper. Uh, or the guy in the Twilight Zone. Yeah, or Rod Sterling, <laughs> yeah, who would, you know, narrate the story to you. Uh, you remember that, like, we were yeah, driving the back? Demon yeah. Tree. yeah, the Demon Tree. Uh, we had to listen to a couple stories like that where the narrator would talk you through the story, kind of the Crypt Keeper with the beginning, you know, and then the characters would take it from there and he'd occasionally intercede during the